Um, so, first of all, uh, there was a homework last week, as you may have noticed. I really struggled long to make a homework, and then in the end, I was really unhappy with what I made. It was just the same pandas shit over and over again, and I didn't want that. Um, so, I obviously, as you saw, didn't make any homework, didn't publish any homework, and uh, then I decided that we just didn't have this week's homework because it was a half week anyway. And that means you only have to have 9 homework instead of 10, so that's not very bad for you, isn't it good? So, yeah, there will be no homework until Thursday, and on Thursday we just continue normally. Um, yeah, there was also not a bonus. I have a bonus. Um, I stole a bonus. But we're not ready for it yet because uh, there, were, there was stuff inside that we wanted to have uh, in two lectures. So, uh, we will uh, do Accomplish that bonus exercise afterwards. It's, oh, it's okay. Um, yes, so this week we will talk about making experiments, so using libraries uh, to actually make experiments on a computer, not a cycle by the way. And then next week we're gonna um, look at stats models, which is there for analyzing experiments, so basically the same stuff you would normally do in R, making ANOVAs and the like or generalized linear models. Um, real quick, uh, just the basics, and then we talk about other plotting libraries, and then we are almost done with that. So I updated uh, a bit in the lecture, and I think now it's more accurate. So, oh no, I, I mixed up next week and then two weeks again. So we have more visualization next week, which is um, Seaborn and other libraries, uh, QQ plots, as you may know them from R2. Um, yeah, then statistical modeling, which is stars models, which you know from our interactive data analysis, which is basically live stuff. Um, we showed you that in the whirlwind tour, where you can, for example, have uh, sliders in your Jupyter notebook and then look at your data um, interactively and also um, telling you a bit about speed ups and how to increase the speed. And then we will have this steady A to Z and questions for the exams. So study A to Z is just something where like, we start with the experiment, we design the experiment, we do the experiment, we analyze the experiment, we plot the stuff, blah, blah, from start to finish, and that's also the week right before the exam, for those who want to take the exam. Uh, so this would be right before that. Uh, yeah, um, so about the exam, we want to write the exam at the computer. And so in a computer lab, basically if you want any exam that's to be a steel, it will look basically like this. So it will also be an open book, so you can use any resource you like, except chatting with each other. Um, so you, always, you don't have to learn uh, the API by heart, you can Google that, because if you program normally, you would also have Google wide right open there and Stack Overflow wide right open there, and just look everything up um, as you do it. Um, and yeah, we will do that in uh, Duke Meta Lab, so the Duke Meta Notebook again, so we will use the Duke Meta Notebook for certain homework to, to distribute uh, the Excel to work in this Duke Meta Notebook, and then when the time is done, um, hopefully it will automatically just it won't be able to work on it anymore. And then we will not automatically correct that, but manually, such that you don't, like, there's one pixel difference uh, that won't be, uh, I think, you won't get either 0 or 100%, zero or but if there's one pixel mismatch, you get a uh, decent percentage. Yeah. Uh, is the exam for all, or just for the people who signed up on the B? Just for the people who signed up, okay. So, uh, as we said in the first week, if you, uh, if you successfully um, uh, worked on 9 by now homework sheets, then you get the pass grade anyway, and then if you additionally want to write the exam, you can get a better grade, and if you fail the exam, you just get the pass anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so let's talk about experiments and making experiments. So I will not show you PsychoPy. Um, the reason is easy because I hate PsychoPy. Why do I hate PsychoPy? Because it sucks. Um, so, I had this lecture last week, and last week, uh, last year, and last year I couldn't manage to install PsychoPy because PsychoPy, oh, okay, so it doesn't really work on Linux, by now it does work on Linux, and by now they've updated quite a bit, so they recently, um, at January of this year, hired a full-time developer instead of just being this open source thing, and it does them good because now it does support Linux, it does support Python 3, 
which it didn't until last year. So until January of this year, it still relied on Python 2, which is more than 10 years of Python 3 is already 10 years old. So it's a, it's a really outdated library. Right now it's becoming a bit better because they're actively working on it again. Um, but it's still pretty much of a pain. So um, they finally updated their installation instructions um, such that now it makes sense. But it's still quite a bit. Um, I mean, I can. Yeah, so it's still. I can. I have an environment here um, which I installed the way Psychopy wants um, users to install it. And if I just hit Conda list here, these are all the packages Psychopy installs. Uh, these are all the dependencies Psychopy needs. It's a 149. So Psychopy is a huge thing and a pain to install it still. I mean, now it's just a few commands and not just Googling and Googling and Googling. Now it works, and if I now want Psychopy, so it does work, at least, in Linux. Um, but I still, I'm still not a fan of it. So uh, we see Psychopy is like, it does have this view, so we're actually coding. Um, most people use it from the other view. And the builder view, because Psychopy, let's see, let's see, because Psychopy is made for non-coders, and in Psychopy you just like this is your timeline, and you just add a stimulus here, blah blah, and then in this timeline somewhere, which becomes a stimulus, and this is made for non-coders. It's a nice back and forth interface. It does make sense if you're just somebody working with it and not used to coding, but uh, we have design students who are used to coding, so we can do that. Okay, so Psychopy did become a lot better now. Um, its dependencies are not as outdated as they used to be. It's still, like, it's, it's still not really good. It's still not really close cross platform compatible. So I had a few errors running it on Linux again. Um, many unexpected things and bugs. Installation is still a pain. A bit better than before. Like you can install it now, but I still really don't like it. Um, and yeah, so again, these are all the requirements. Okay, yeah, if you want to install and use Strikeover anyway, um, they have installation instructions and the ones for um, Miniconda, which obviously we're going to use, are quite fine. So you see, these are all the dependencies they want to install. Um, I don't know why they just why they just don't provide a package where they just install it, pick install Strikeover, that you can specify the requirements. I don't know why they do that. I really don't like second part, but if you want to use it, um, like this is uh, a demo for the non-coder interface. This is a talk where one of the developers of Psychopy talks about the changes to Psychopy 3. Like I said, now that they have a full-time developer, they started really working on it again. They support online experiments and stuff, which is quite nice. Um, but again, uh, I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't use this, and this is why I don't talk about it. I do have, however, so last year uh, when Antonia and Mo made the basic program, basic program in Python class, uh, they made a lecture about Psychopy and I've added it so you see it right here. So the PDF is there, if you want to look at it, you can. I don't talk about it. Okay, um, let's go on the turn. And where do we start? Well, let's first think about what we need when we want to make our experiment. We need some kind of graphical user interface, so obviously there must be some place the user looks at and where the user sees the stimulus and stuff, which is the GUI. Um, on this GUI we need stimuli, so visual, we can also auditory stimulus is something the user sees and must react to. And the user reacts, because otherwise what, what, are we, what are we doing in our study? So we need user input, we need an experiment flow, so we need to well, have an order of things, like at first show stimulus 1, then wait for a keyboard input, then, wait, then show stimulus 2, wait for a keyboard input again and stuff. So this is an experiment flow, and more than that, we need experiment design, where we say, well, first you show this stimulus 10 times, and then you make a break, and then you show this stimulus 20 times, mixed with that one, blah, blah. So we need to have some kind of experiment design. We need to have data logging, of course, otherwise just what, what are we doing if we don't log uh, the times, for example, or whatever the user typed in there? Well, there's nothing we can work on if we don't have any data at all. And sometimes if we use, for example, EEG markers, so if you're working with an EEG, like an EEG study, 
um, um, we need serial port communication. Okay, let's start with graphic user interfaces um, because we didn't look at it uh, at all in Python. So we showed nice plots, but we didn't make any graphical user interface. Um, there are, of course, quite a few libraries, um, and many of them rely on Pygame for their um, oh, not again. for their graphical user interface. So we're going to look at Pygame at first. So these libraries, like PsychoPy, which I'm going to show you in a second. So Again, rely on, rely on Pygame um, as the back end to show anything on the Google. Okay, um, Pygame. So let's look at how Pygame looks like. Let's look into what's going on there. So um, Pygame is in the requirement, so we can just import it, support Pygame. Um, then we have to initialize it before we do anything. We have to call Pygame.init, otherwise everything else in Pygame doesn't work. You're going to notice. Um, and then, yeah, what do we do here? We make a display. This display has a caption. Um, let's look. We set um, the size for our display, which is 240 times 180, so it's not too big here. And then we show this um, for five seconds, and then we quit. So what do we notice? Well, it does say in the program, there's nothing on there, and what happens when I press the X? Nothing. Hmm. Why, doesn't, uh, why is there nothing? Well, because it's non-reactive. So while this why this window here is open, it doesn't react to any user input because we didn't tell it to. It's just passively waiting. It's just waiting for five seconds doing nothing. And this here will be some kind of event which we would tend, which we would need to handle. Obviously we don't because we're just sleeping for five seconds. And then we're closing it again. So uh, it's obviously non-reactive and it's just a very, very basic frame of how to implement um, a GUI in Python. So, let's go one step further. Let's make something that actually does something, more or less. So, um, we can even have a logo, so this is just a bit more. So, this just has this logo in the top right corner, just like the Firefox icon here. Um, we set that. The caption we had already, it's not shown here. We again set this into our window, small mode of 240 times 180. And now what we do, instead of this passive waiting with sleeping, we have to perform active waiting. Active waiting means that we have some kind of event loop. So something which is looping all, all the time and waiting for events to happen. Like I said, if I press the top right button, that's an event, an event of type pygame.event uh, or pygame.quit. And we just have to call this all the time. So if we're sleeping, um, there's going to be an event because uh, like it's multiplied and there's just some thread which tells map the button was pressed and it gives me an event to my main thread which is what I'm implementing in here. But if we just don't react to it, nothing's going to happen. We act, have to react to it manually via our code. So what we have to do, we have to actively wait and have this infinite loop where we don't want to have an infinite loop because where we want to be able to quit and like I said, uh, pressing this top wide right X or pressing Alt F4 is uh, the event is an event of type pygame.quit. And if that event happens, so we're polling, polling events here, we're getting the events. This just looks at the um, at the queue which is there uh, throughout the threads. And 
pulls them and checks if there are new events, and if there are events, and we're going to get to this part, and then we can look if our event is of type print, and if so, we actually quit. So we stop this loop, and we call pygame.quit. Um, let's show this in the terminal. I don't want to run this kind of stuff in, in my IPython, because sometimes it leads to a few problems. So I'm just going to run them from the terminal. So what do we see here? Well, it's on all the time, so we're now in this main event group, and it's just running through there, and running through there, and running through there, and as soon as we close it, um, we go here, go to running, say, set one into false, and quit. Yeah, so what did we see? Well, Pygame must at first be initialized. Um, before we initialize some settings for display, I'll show you that already, and then we have the display mode. So, um, we normally wouldn't want to have an experiment in this tiny uh, display, of course. So we can toggle full screen, and this is the display to full screen. Uh, however, this only stretches the screen such that it's presented in full screen mode. So it still has a resolution of this 240 times 180. And if I want to get, uh, if I want to have a true full screen, I have to look at well, what is my resolution, my full screen resolution of uh, my, of my display. So, uh, what is the full screen resolution of my display? We will have two um, full HD monitors next to the other, so this is obviously my resolution. And if we um, don't do this, it's going to lead to errors. Okay, I'm going to show this now anyway and hope it doesn't completely die here. So, in this copy, I'll copy what I said. Um, so we set it to this 240 times 180 size and then told it the full screen just to show you what is going to happen. I think I'm just going to be able to see this on my other screen. Yeah. So this one turned blank and on the laptop screen you see that I have this one. Oh no, it just cloned the windows. Okay, so it cloned the displays. Um, and now if I restart it again, it actually works in this configuration. Okay, so uh, there's a huge problem and that is that Pygame can't really work with multiple monitors. Um, that's a bit shitty um, because if I, because experiment relies on Pygame and if I have two monitors, it's going to show it right in the middle of the two monitors. So you're going to see, only, you're only going to see half of that on the screen. I hope that doesn't happen because that also supports the window mode. So that's just to show you, that's why I'm going to show you everything I'm going to show you in the window mode. There is this full screen mode, but it doesn't really work with multiple um, screens. Okay, but this worked way better than I expected. Okay, but instead of this, um, instead of stretching, uh, stretching what uh, resolution we have to the screen, um, we could also uh, go for the full screen resolution right away, which is, um, so we just check what our full screen resolution is, set that to our resolution, and then if we run that, we're going to have two full screens, so the mouse is not going to be four times as big or something. Okay, um, what else did I change? Uh, oh yeah, I just showed here that, well, how do you react to keyboard presses? I'm going to get to that actually uh, a bit later, but just to show you here, I can also like switch from full screen to non-full screen um, via pressing the F key here, and because it sometimes crashed and sometimes didn't, I, uh, because sometimes it didn't react to this Pygame to quit and then I had to restart my laptop I just made sure that I can also escape by pressing the escape key. Um, so, if you look at this now, it's going to have the full resolution. Ah, we see. Ah, it again mirrored my display. So, you see there's the mouse here and if I press F, uh, it's going to change to the windowed mode. And now probably... Yeah, now I mirrored my screens again. Okay, and now I'm back to my normal stuff. So like I said, it sometimes the problems with two screens. It doesn't matter for you, it's just harder for the presentation. Okay, I told you already that um, 
rules must perform active waiting, so we have this event loop, and if we just sleep there, well, nothing's going to happen. It will make it stop responding, and for example, it cannot react to something like this, um, to the X at the, bot at the top right corner. Yeah, um, making multi-coded programming in Python even harder because Python sucks at multi-coding, but that's fine. But we, what we see here that every game, and for that matter also every study we have, must be in this main game loop. So every game we ever make, created Python, must adhere to the structure of the main game loop. So at first we initialize stuff, and then we have this main loop, which is while running, or while true, or while whatever, and then we react to stuff happening in the game, in this main game loop, and this is just the structure of everything um, which involves a GUI, because otherwise you cannot code in GUIs. Okay, so as much for the general frame of our GUI, um, let's look at stimuli. So we cannot have an experiment where without showing anything. And how do we do this in Pygame? Well, anything visual must first be created as a surface, and then use this blit function to copy the contents on the surface to the surface which we're actually showing. Um, but what we're showing has a front buffer and a back buffer, and every time we blit something, so we create a new something, and then when we blit it, we copy it to the back buffer of our surface, and it doesn't update our screen, only if we flip the display, we change back and front such that everything we put onto the back buffer at first is now at the front. Okay, so if we want to update what we have to do at first, so this is, again, the normal stuff in short already, blah, 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 set more to one for this already. At first we create this image, we create a surface for the image, so we load an image and have an uh, pygame.image object there. And then we blit that, so we show that to our screen. Actually, I don't know what blit stands for. Is that a word? We blit that to um, the back buffer of our screen. We can say, uh, so we can say where we want to do that. But to actually show that, we have to flip the display so that the back buffer is now the front buffer. And if we show this, well, we're going to have something on the screen. So this is just the first image that appeared when looking at copyright free images. And you see, so this works. So if we didn't flip the display, it wouldn't, I can't comment it here, um, if we didn't flip the display, it wouldn't show that at all, because, well, uh, it would have been drawn on the back buffer, and we didn't flip the back and the front buffer, so nothing's going to be updated here. Okay, um, there's a possibility to have images which actually scale with, did that work now? Of course it did. Um, there's a possibility to show images which actually scale with the size. Um, you just have to look for the event video resize because well, if we are um, changing this screen, uh, if we're changing the display, rather the window um, it's in, um, what's going to happen from a program perspective is that um, the operating system is going to send an event to the program uh, owning this window, and it has to react actively to this. And this is, for example, an event of type video resize. So in Pygame, if we import everything from pygame.locals, that's going to be, for example, also this video resize. And if an event is of type uh, pygame.video resize, then we can react to this, and we have to explicitly scale our image we had so far, blit that again to the back buffer, and flip the buffer again. So this is smooth if we run it. Um, and it works perfectly fine, and it's the way we always do stuff um, when working with Windows. So, I'm not going to show it, you can believe me that it works, you can execute it uh, um, at your laptop. It's just to show you how to do a result of the window. But we don't, look at, we don't do that for studies anyway, because studies, like, the user doesn't have any interaction there, because it's just a full screen window, where something happens and the user has to react by pressing buttons, right? Okay, but for that, what else do we need? Well, we need text. Um, note that Pygame accepts only absolute coordinates on the display. So to set a text precisely over to have it, for example, at half the height of our display, where we have to play around with the coordinates uh, or implement something for relative coordinates ourselves. So this is, for example, the way I did it. Um, I have a few constants here. Um, for example, I set the font size, uh, the font size 
relative uh, by the screen size. So I'm getting the screen, so I, I tell you what the screen size here is, and that's going to be then the size of my of my display. Uh, depending on that, I make my own font size. Font color is white because my background color is black. And then I have just variables for so constants for center, middle, and center, bottom, and top, such that I can use them um, instead of the numbers. And then, so in my uh, main function, what do I do? Well, I first erase the text using screen.fill black, so this just erases every, everything which was printed on the screen before. And then we make a new font. Yeah, we have to create the font first. So this is the size and this is um, the font style. If we say none, it uses the system font style, which is, I think, done something else on Windows and Linux, but um, it doesn't matter for you. And then we have to render this font. And how do we render this? Well, we have a few arguments. Well, first of all, we have this text we want to render. And then the next is, this is anti-aliasing. Anti uh, so, if it makes it, like if it fits it to smaller sizes, if it shall, uh, when it tries to fit it to smaller sizes, if it shall anti aliase If you don't know what that means, just look it up on Wikipedia and it says more and I can explain you with our front color and our background color. And this is just a surface where the text is. So I showed you before, we have to first create the image of the surface for the text and that's just somewhere in this variable text surface. And if we want to get that on the screen where we have to tell, we have to blit it, and we have to say, we have to say uh, where we want to have it. Like I said, because it only accepts absolute coordinates, I just wrote this function which, um, for example, accepts well, which accepts the screen because we need the size of the screen. It needs the surface because we need to know how long the text is because, for example, for the uh, left, wide, middle, we need to know how long the text is. And if we want to have it precisely in the middle, we want to have it not starting at the middle, but we want to have the middle of the surface in the middle. So I have to look at the width of our surface too, and then this constant telling me uh, where I want to print it, so it's just some number. And then the get position function simply takes where the full size of my screen and of my text, and then where it puts it into width divided by 2 minus text width divided by 2 such that it's complete in the middle, and the same for the height in the case of the center. A bit below that, if I want to have it just one line below the center and then at the bottom or at the top um, if I want to specify it. So this is how I would represent text here and if we look at it we see it does show this text uh, pretty much at the top. If I, had a, if I had another resolution it would be also fine and also right at the top and just like that I can tell it to have a text for example at the center and then it would be now at the center. Um, yeah. Make relative coordinates yourself because you can only, uh, IEM only works with absolute coordinates. Yeah, um, one last thing I wanted to show you moving stimuli. So imagine we had some image which we wanted to move around. How do we have, how do we have to do that? Well, we can do that only in our main game loop. So we have to update continually in our main game loop the position of our object. So we first create this image. Um, this here sets the color white to 155 to transparent such that it doesn't have a background. It's a JPEG image, so there was a mistake because JPEG changes colors a bit, so it looks a bit shitty. That's just a demonstration for you. And then this is um, where, the, where the position where we put the image at first, and this is like in every step we want to update the x and y position by this, so it just moves by 10 pixels per update step. And then what do we do? Well, for all iterations of our main game loop, we make the screen blank, we draw the image onto the position of our screen, which we calculated and new each time, so we just add this step x and step y to that, and then we make sure that if it's outside the bounds of the screen, we just inverse the direction, so it's going to be times negative one, such that it inverses the direction from left to right, and from um, top to bottom, and vice versa each. And then we have to flip the display again, and then we want to sleep for a bit, so that it doesn't go too fast. And then, because everything we must do, we must do in this main game loop, uh, we also have to pay attention that um, we look at all the events and handle the events. So this kill event is just a lambda function that looks 
which looks if we either press the top right button or press escape and if so it will just close it and break out of its main loop and then uh, quit by game. So if we do this now um, we're going to have something nice going around here. So like I said uh, it looks a bit shitty because it's not perfectly white at the edges because it's a JPEG and you shouldn't do that with JPEGs. Um, but yeah, so if we want to move anything, we have to do so in the main game loop, and we still can't forget uh, to have any kind of event handling in this main game loop too. Ah, yeah. Okay. Uh, in fact, what I'm doing here is I'm always um, redrawing a completely new uh, black background. If I wanted to go for performance, that would be not the smartest way, but instead I would work with dirty rectangles, allowing me to only update part of the screen, so I would look where, where do you want to delete something. So I would look at the position where the image was before, define that as a dirty rectangle, this is where I want to update that, and then I could only update this part of the screen, instead of filtering the entire screen. I write a link here, but it doesn't matter that much, because we don't make games, we only make studies, and uh, performance is not as important there. And then, yeah, of course, uh, we also have auditory stimuli. Um, we can do that in Python 2, uh, in Pygame, comma, 2, exclamation mark. And we're just using this Pygame mixer, and that can then, where we have to initialize Pygame again, and then that mixer, after we initialize it, can just play wave files. Ouch. Uh, and it works perfectly fine. So, if you wanted to have auditory stimuli, you could also do that in Pygame. Okay, so much we only showed stuff. Um, let's also look at user input because when in our studies we obviously have user input too. And like I said already before, so user input is also an event just like pressing your X. And yeah, but precisely it's an event of type highgate.keydown. And if we encounter an event of such a type, then we can check for which key it is. So there's this reference of which key, what like uh, the constants for the keys. So we can check if an event is of type pygame.keydown and uh, the event is k underscore n, that would be our n key on the keyboard. Um, and to, like in studies, what we normally do is wait for a certain set of keys, so I don't know, press left if this kind of stimulus appeared, if you think this kind of stimulus appeared, and press right if you think another kind of stimulus appeared. So what we do, is we change our main game loop a bit um, and change this active waiting a bit with these functions. So for example, this is what that may look like. So this is just a function that waits for any key. Again, it's an infinite loop, so this replaces our main game loop object such that in our main function we don't have to write this by true, but we just can write wait for any key. What then for this then it does is where it looks for all events which it gets and returns only if uh, the event was either of type key down or when it quits when the event was of type quit. And then um, it again checks if the key was escape or alt f here, alt f4. And in that case it returns false. So what we have to do in our main function is we have to see if this returns false and if it returns false we have to quit because we don't have this main game loop uh, inside the main function anymore but here. So we have to handle this false as uh, we have to interpret this written. And otherwise, we turn event of key, which returns the number for the key, which we can uh, then compare with whatever we want to have. So we can then check if wait for if wait any key equals k underscore m, and then we have press an end. So just that as we have this wait for any key, we can have this wait for uh, a certain key. Uh, method. So this here we specify which key we're waiting for, and it only returns true if the key we pressed was this very key, or when it can also quit when we want to quit. Yeah. I don't really get what's the difference between the uh, key quit and quit uh, on the key um, This, the uh, this is a different type. So like I said, any any kind of interaction is an event of some type. For example, moving the screen, uh, moving the window is a type of, uh, is an event of type, I don't know, pi game move, whatever. Resizing the screen is an event of type uh, move. And clicking this X is simply an event of type pi game dot quit. Can this K? 
escape is, in, is a key DOM, and namely the key escape was, was uh, pressed. Okay, so it is just a cross, and escape key is just a button you have to click to like, read the drop down. Excuse me? Yeah, um, um, I'm not sure that you get it. So quit is like a, an X across to, to quit the program. Yeah. yeah. And the uh, key escape is a button yes. you have to click to. Yeah, like we define it like this. We don't. We wouldn't need to do that. So if we didn't have this, then we couldn't escape. With it, like we couldn't end the program with the escape key. Okay. Sometimes you want that because you don't want the user to quit. But you always want the user to be able to quit um, when pressing the top right button or when pressing Alt F4. So if you don't have it in there, there's no way except interrupting the kernel uh, to quit the program, which sucks if you're on full screen. Because if you're on full screen, any key will be set, like anything you press on um, your keyboard, for some weird reason, even control alt delete, um, which really sucks, <laughs> and then it gets sent to Pygame, and Pygame is just the work on it. And if you don't implement something to respond to some kind of crit event, then the only way to exit Pygame is just uh, killing your computer and restarting it. So you want to do this because otherwise you would have to restart the computer. You want to make sure that you have this event handling in there, at least when you when you're on full screen. If you're in only in window mode, it's not important because then you can unfocus um, the window where this here is running, and then it doesn't intercept all keyboard presses, right? And then you can kill Python or just open the task manager and kill Python in there, or just restart the kernel or whatever. Um, but yeah, so everything is an event. Like I said, this is an event of type crit, and key downs are just an event of type uh, key. Uh, high angle key down. So an event of type high angle key down. So mouse click is also an event of type high angle mouse click, I guess. I'm not sure right now. I have to look it up. Um, but yeah, anything is an event, and we have to handle these events. So let's execute this. And yeah, so these functions are what's left from our main game loop of the previous examples. Um, so it's actively waiting here. If we incorporate that, we, like I said, we have to make sure for the return value of this wait any key or wait key. And yeah, using all this, I made a really tiny program which could be a first study. So. Uh, let's make this sample experiment, and what does the user have to do? Well, the user is supposed to press left for even numbers and right for odd numbers. Um, we didn't look at measuring response times yet, so we just play your sound when the subject was wrong. Okay, and this just incorporates everything I showed you before. Uh, so we need high game, time, random, blah, blah. We set um, sizes and colors. We set these constants, which just stand for where we want to print the text. The state position we also had, just you provide one of these four constants, and depending on the constant, it's just going to um, return the position of where you actually, the absolute position of where you actually put the text. This way for any key, and wait for certain key functions. We had before, and then we have our main function. And in our main function, well, first of all, we have to pre initialize our mixer because we want to play a sound, I said that before. So we do that first, then we initialize Python, then we create a display, and we create a display of size 800 by 600. And it's not in full screen, so it's in window mode because I can't show you full screen because my computer will make, may fail. Um, we make the screen blank, uh, black. We create two fonts such that we can, so these are just objects of type Python.font, and we can simply render them. So we can reuse them all over the place. It's just something that Pygame knows which font style and which font site we want to use. So we create one font and one a bit smaller font. Okay, and then what do we do? Um, we start by showing a welcome message. How do we do this? Well, we call font.render and then our welcome message, and that simply says press left for even numbers and right for anything else. We get the position of where we want to render this. Uh, we show that, actually like, we don't show it yet, we just uh, uh, blit it onto the back plane. Uh, the same thing we'll do for our smaller font, which will be at one line below this line, because well, this function defines it, like the function um, 
uh, their Python and such, we build them onto the back plane too, onto the back plane too. And once we have those two texts on there, we put the display. So that now the display contains this text and this text. Good, what do we then? We wait for a space key because we said space to continue, so we don't do anything um, as long that we stay in this loop, so this way key is a loop. We don't continue until the user either presses escape, and if the user did, um, this way key returns true, uh, and we just continue in this line. If the user however presses escape or the top word X, um, then this wait key return false, and we have to return it. So we explicitly have to write if not blah 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 then return because otherwise there would be a possibility to end our um, main game to end our uh, main function. Okay, so this happens, so this is before we press the enter, so this is the, this just sets stuff up. This here is, um, when does the uh, enter text, this waits for the key. And then, uh, when we load our sound, which is again the speed which was really loud. Um, and, and then, we four times, do something, namely four times show a number, and what do we do uh, when we make a new number? So at first, so this is just to make sure that we don't plot the same number twice in a row, because then you don't see that there was a new number, so we just um, plot some number, so this is just this number here, it's a number from 1 to 9, we make our screen black, we render the number, we find the position of where we want to put it, we bit it, we flip the display shot that the number is actually shown, and then we wait for any key because like, uh, we, any key can be pressed and this now can either be um, well, the escape or either fear or the uh, top right uh, x then we return again and otherwise if so this is just normally we would have more stuff in here this is just the really short version of that we said that well, if you press the left button four numbers which are odd uh, or if you press the white button for numbers that are even, you play this wrong sound. So like I said, for the start, it's just something visual, we don't lock stuff, we just saw that here. And so if the user presses something wrong, we play the sound, we do that four times. Um, and then after these four times, we make a black screen again, we render some goodbye message, uh, it with the display, wait for the key, and then once we're done, so never mind what key was pressed here because we're quitting afterwards anyway. So this just uh, performs some kind of active waiting until the user presses key. Okay, so if you look at this, uh, so we get the welcome instructions, um, we press basic continue. Uh, it shows a 9, what did I say, left for each, so let me do it wrong, I press left, press the sound, now I do it correct, I press right, I press right, I press left, four times it shows this, now it shows thank you for attending, and we're done. So this is how we would just normally would present that in full screen, but like I said, two screens can't do that. Um, but yeah, this is like the easiest kind of experiment um, we can do in Pygame. Um, yeah, as much for Pygame, um, I wanted to show you Pygame at first because the principle for every kind of GUI and also for every kind of uh, library for making experiments, for example, Spyro and also Psychopy, rely on stuff like this. I don't, I don't know if Py, no, Pygame, uh, Experiment, uh, Psychopy does not rely on Pygame but on uh, WX Python, which is uh, just another one shitty um, stuff for uh, making GUIs. I really don't like WX Python, it's also really outdated there. This is such as from 2010 or something, just so old and outdated. Um, but never mind that. Um, the, what I want to tell is that all um, kinds of experiment libraries and all kinds of game libraries must follow this kind of structure. So for example, this active waiting and waiting for keys, how we put something onto the screen, Underlyingly, it's all the same. And underlyingly, experiment, which I'm going to show you right now, also uses um, 
also uses phi dim. Actually, uh, put something to the screen. So, making a GUI and then showing stimuli in there and waiting for keys. Um, experiment does that and more. So, experiment is a complete library. So, it's a, first of all, it's a pure program library. So, we don't have this builder view like we have an experiment. It's really lightweight and doesn't have 150 dependencies, but only like 10, which is really lightweight compared to that. Entirely with the Python. And it's simply installed a git install experiment. Oh, it can be so easy. Okay, so like I said, it builds on top of Pygame, a similar, similar way of initializing um, GUIs, with a simply working with user input, but it gives uh, more functionality. For example, wait, what did we look at before, what we wanted to have in a study, we wanted to have also to be able to um, define experiment design, uh, save everything, and make useful logging, and provide more functions like an actual timer and like giving me a quick point and so on, so all that's done by experiment. But like I said, experiment for stimulus presentation, for recording of inputs and outputs events, so we did this already in Pygame. We didn't communicate with other devices so far, um, we didn't collect and process our data, and we didn't have anything which helped us in our experiment design besides just having a loop and putting one, one thing after the other. And Pygame does all of that. So this is just the package, we have experiment, so this has uh, these five sub-packages. There's one for experiment design, in which there is an experiment, block, and trial class. So experiment, if you want to make an experiment, experiment, the experiment from type experiment, and in your experiment there are blocks, and every block consists of multiple trials. And this is how we make our uh, design. Then we have a class, um, a package of stimuli, so we can have auditory, auditory similar videos, pictures, text, and so on and so on. And um, it supports I.O., so input for mouse and keyboard, but also triggers for EEGs and uh, information from the EEGs, all that kind of stuff. Like I said, it also has stuff like a uh, clock and a buffer. Um, so the clock is really useful because the standard clock of the system may not be as accurate. It definitely uses the most accurate system timer you have there is. And then it has this control package, like I said, it uh, puts everything into a nice um, main structure of a program where we first initialize an experiment, then start it, and then able to pause it, and then in the end we end it. So these are just the functions which Pygame relies on, uh, experiment relies on, which experiment wants you to use. Um, excuse me, yeah. could you um, explain what the buffer here means? Um, we at the end needed to... Okay, so uh, it's just uh, pre-buffer stuff. Why is that useful? Because in experiments you want to have millisecond accuracy mm -hmm. and putting something onto the screen is not millisecond accurate. So sometimes it takes longer, sometimes like it depends on the update interval of the system, all kinds of stuff, and experiment simply makes sure to put that onto the system on the right time, and then to make sure uh, to know how much time it needed to put that on the display. Um, doesn't matter, we're going to see it later when it's used, it's just uh, stuff which experiment um, needs. So it's just more precise in timing in uh, this special case. Okay, um, yeah, all of these models can be used independently of each other, which is nice, and we can just make um, our experiment design using experiment, and then, for example, just save that to a CSV file, and then um, use, uh, use um, Pygame or PsychoPy if you want to use that anyway, um, so we can use another software for presentation of stimuli and so on and so on. Okay, um, we've seen stimuli and so on already, so let's start with something else now, let's start with experiment control. Um, which is uh, the very wide thing. And every, simply every experiment, experiment here is the main control structure as specified by the package. And this control package then provides me access to a screen, a keyboard, a log file, clock, and device communication. So I assume 
as I used um, experiment.initialize, I have experiment.screen.keyboard.whatever. Okay, so like I said, we have this we have this three landmarks, we have initialize, start, and end. When we initialize it, it starts up the screen and shows the screen already and provides access to the screen over experiment.screen. It provides me access to the keyboard, to the log files, to the events, to the terminal clock, and so on and so on. And simply prepares everything such that it loads faster and such that it works only. And then as soon as I use um, um, control.start, it asks for a subject ID. So experiment also takes that from me. I don't have to... So I didn't do that in the spy game thing here, right? I didn't show, I didn't ask for any subject number, now you would have to do that. And experiment, it automatically does that for, for me as soon as I, uh, as soon as I use um, control at start. And then it saves the subject that even, so that I have, I have access to it. And as soon as I have the subject, it also makes my um, data file, to which I'm going to write. And then, yeah, between the start and end, there's the main loop of our program. So we iterate through our hierarchical design, like I said, we have an experiment which consists of block, blocks, which in turn consists of trials. So this is how we iterate through our design. And then in the end, we end our experiment, and as soon as we call end, it um, closes everything and saves the data. Okay, so let's do that here. Like I said, we create a new experiment. So that's uh, experiment of design experiment. Every experiment has a name. We initialize it um, such that first it shows the startup screen and then it initializes um, these objects as part of our experiment. Right. Um, then we sleep for a bit and then as soon as we hit the start here it will show the subject number screen and then after we enter our subject number the ready screen and then two, sec so, uh, two seconds later we will end the entire stuff. So if we run this now we're going to see that we see a screen um, experiment will take some time, it waits. Let me just show you. Do you want to switch to window mode? Yes, that's really nice if we are um, Jupyter who asked me when I first started if we want to use um, the window mode. And now we see it still takes a bit of time to initialize. So that's because, like I said, Pygame wants to be millisecond accurate. And to be millisecond accurate, so if you first start. Um, Not perfect on the interactive kernel. Normally, you would, have, you would want to have it as an external, um, as a .py file, and not inside the, um, and not inside a Jupyter notebook. Okay, um, but let's do that again. Show that the window mode, blah blah blah. Let's be, let's be real quick this time. Like I said, experiment wants to make sure that it has this millisecond accuracy, and if we start up um, programs at first due to um, the schedule of the operating system, it's not going to be as accurate because at first the operating system doesn't know how many resources to allocate for each, um, for each uh, program and thus the program wants to run for a little while to have, accurate, to have more accurate timing. Which is why experiment here waits for 10 seconds um, when starting it. So we're going to see it here again. Uh, this is the last time I'm showing it like this. So it will wait. Mm. Okay, so this doesn't really work too nice on my um, Jupyter lab. It's, oh, okay, I should have just pressed something there. Oops. Okay, so it would have worked. Um, but luckily, there's also the um, the whatever mode, uh, the develop mode. Uh, in the develop mode, it's a bit faster. Um, and doesn't wait this 10 seconds and doesn't ask for the subject ID. So if you actually, so if you use experiment to make an experiment, you wouldn't use um, this develop mode because you want to show it on full screen because normally it's not as a full screen because the user shouldn't be distracted by whatever else on the window, right, on the display. Um, you would want to have the subject ID and you want to have actual timing. Uh, but if you're only developing it, you don't care for either of these things, 
because you don't let yourself be distracted by other stuff on the screen, and you don't care for that much precise timing, and you don't need subject edits anyway. So if we're developing, we're going to use this develop mode. And this makes it real faster, it always shows up in the window, and now it waits for two seconds, and now it should be done. So like I said, all this stuff has problems on the front. But interestingly, it worked before. I don't know why it doesn't work right now. Um, but luckily, I also have PyCharm, and I showed you PyCharm last week, so I don't have to show it to you right now, because you already seen it. And let's just run this here in PyCharm, and we see now it shows the screen for two seconds, one, two. And let it down and do it just one. Okay, that's interesting. Hmm. But it worked in my system. Ah, shit. <laughs> I have to press a button to uh, initialize it. So now it's ready. Now I press the button. Ah, okay, that was so good. Good, so it works perfectly here on, and if I have it as a normal Python file. Okay, so between this initialize and the start, we, so we have this initialize where it makes it element dot whatever else we need. Between this initialize and the start, we write whatever we want to prepare for our um, experiment, and then between start and stop, we iterate, we have this basically this main experiment loop in which. Um, we loop over um, the blocks of the experiment, all blocks of the experiment, and then do all swires of the block. Ah, it would have worked here too. I'm just a stupid to press a button. So, in the valid mode, press a button as soon as it's ready. Ah. Okay, um, as much for this um, main control flow, so like I said, uh, we initialize, then we start, then we end. Um, yeah, I will um, put that all into a context manager for now. This is not how we would normally do this, so this is just for demonstration purposes because I don't always want to write these few lines. So I just made a context manager which, when initializing it, makes the design of the experiment and then it starts initialize, and then as soon as we enter this loop, uh, this, uh, this context manager, I mean, it first um, uh, runs control at start, and as soon as we exit the context manager, we control again. So like I said, this is just for demonstration purposes. Normally, you would always build up a program um, like this. Okay, but I want to show you the stimuli first, how we make stimuli in experiment. I showed you already how to make them in Pygame. Now, let's look at how we do that in experiment. And my experiment also contains classes for user knowledge of assembly, but unlike iGame, we don't flip the buffer because it simply has a function which includes this flipping the buffer. And this is this present function. And this present function simply, so it has the arguments clear, update, and whatever the last one is, we don't look at this. Um, so clear clears the screen, clears the buffers before going, so that means we don't have to. Um, have to have, have to have a black background at first. So if we look at how we did that in Pygame, we first uh, filled the screen with our black color, and or rather let's look at here. We first filled the screen with the black color, then we rendered it, and then we flipped the display. And all this stuff is now just um, put into one function, and then we can clear the display before or not, and we can update the buffers after or not. So that makes it really much easier to present multiple um, stimuli on the same screen. Okay, and like I said, uh, you can and should preload the stimuli such that they are fully loaded on, up on presentation. This is to make timing more accurate because this preloading takes some time, or rather the loading takes some time, and if you have the loading inside your experiment loop, um, your timing will be inaccurate. Only by a few milliseconds, but I mean a few milliseconds are relevant. And we should always um, preload them such that they don't disturb us in the timing of the experiment itself. So yeah, 
I don't want to show you the user control on landmarks, so I use the context manager to do that. I showed you this already. And yeah. So how do we present text? Well, we create a new target as inline of text line with um, the text and the text size. So we don't have to create a font on it here, it makes it really much easier. And then we show a fixed boss. So Pygame also has this fixed uh, experiment also has this fixed boss, it's just this fixation point, this fixation force, if you made any kind of study here, I think you've already seen it. Uh, so for anything visual, we have the fixed force, which we're looking at at first, it's always in the middle of the screen. And then we preload our target, then we wait a bit, so this is the same as time and sleep, but using the experiment block, we present our target, and then we wait for another second. So how does this look like? It's ready now, so as soon as I press a button, it shows the uh, fixed course for a second, and then shows the text for a second. For a second. Yeah. So that works really easy. So this is how we do the text. How do we present the sound? Well, we have still the tone, and this is just some kind of tone at some frequency with some duration. Um, you can also make it play wave files, but this is the easiest kind of stimuli if you just want to have auditory cues, for example. As soon as you hear the tone, look at the screen, whatever. Okay, um, we can have objects, for example, the rectangle here. Um, this is just some kind of rectangle. It has the size 50 in x direction, 50 y direction, it's in position 2020, and it has the color red. Uh, do we know which color it has? Well, the colors are listed in experiment.consonants. Uh, I have a link to the documentation of experiment where all the constants are listed a bit down below, so you can just set the color um, using one of these constants. Okay, if we want to have multiple objects um, on the same buffer, like I said, we have to clear the screen for the first object because when we want to have a blank background, then we want to wipe the first thing. We don't flip the buffer step because we want to show them all at the same time. And for all um, for all objects like, which are in the middle, we don't clear the screen and we don't flip the buffer, so that we draw all of these on the back buffer. And then for the last one, we flip the buffers so that we show all objects we drew before. So let's make two stimuli. One at position negative 100, one at position 100. We see already experiment as other kinds of another coordinate system where 0, 0 is in the middle. And then, like I said, the first one does have to clear, it doesn't have to update, and the last one doesn't have to clear, but does have to update. And then it looks like this, we present two stimuli um, on the same aspect. So yeah, this is how we show stimuli in Pyramid. Uh, and it's Pyramid. Jesus. Okay, we can also create uh, complex objects. So um, this here shows an OK button, basically. So we make a rectangle, and we make text, and we position it at the position where we put the rectangle already, such that now it's basically more or less a combined um, uh, object, so just at the same position. And then we make a new canvas, and plug, plug those both things onto the canvas. Now if I present the canvas and just um, present the entire thing, including every object I drew onto that canvas. So now I can at will present the canvas and it will always present the combination of my button and my button text because they're all they're both on this canvas. And if we look at it, uh, I, like I said, sometimes it doesn't really work too well in Jupyter. I don't know why I couldn't figure that out. So yeah, when I present that, I have this button at the lower right corner. I can't react to it now because we didn't look at uh, how to control the mouse or how to get mouse input. So I'm just going to show that for five seconds. Um, because sleeping simply blocks the view and is passive waiting. Okay, um, yeah, then I showed you that this experiment package also has uh, the defaults here for everything it has. It has these defaults. And I can just change the defaults, I just want to show you real quick how do we change the defaults. Ah, now I said we start the kernel. Because I'm changing the defaults and I can only do that at first because otherwise I would have loaded them already. 
And let's, for example, so if you always want to show something in the window mode, you can simply change control of defaults in window mode equals two. And then for all um, experiments, we do subsequently in the same script or in the same interactive kernel, everything is going to be windowed. So even if we don't use the developer mode, so normally it would, um, in Drupal to ask if we want to use window mode, window mode on a normal script, use full script mode anyway, and but we can tell it to use window mode anyway. And then we can tell it to use the de this default size, can even change the experiment background color, it's all listed in experiment dot whatever package we're using dot defaults. And if you want to look what's in there, Google the experiment documentation, you will find it. So let's just look at this real quick. This is not going to be a window, um, but not in uh, my develop mode, so it's going to take some time, and I need to enter a subject number, and it takes some time for initialization, and then just show something onto our yellow, yeah, yellow screen. Yay. Okay, just to show you, there are defaults in all these packages, um, and just the documentation. So, you can look at all the stuff which is in this default packages here. So, just the design of defaults, there's also dot control dot defaults. So, if you want to change something, you can change it here. Okay. Um, Let's restart the kernel again because this was a really ugly color. Um, this is a bit better signal demo because sometimes the experiment crashes because I reuse the same experiment name. This here just makes sure that I don't reuse the same experiment name. Helps a bit on the interactive kernel, sometimes it doesn't do good. Okay, um, user input. So, I showed the user input in uh, Pygame already, I didn't show you the current structure. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, because it says that, uh, as I understand it, uh, ex experiment is built on Pygame, right? Yeah. Uh, does that mean that I can access the Pygame methods from experiment? That's a really good question, I didn't even look at that. Uh, I can tell you on Thursday when I try to do that. I don't know yet. I didn't try it out, I should try that out. Um, okay, so we can answer you, I will have some more Okay, um, but let's go for user input, blah blah blah. We have the IO module which is for logging as well as user input. And again, we can, if we like the way Pygame handles user input, if we like it more than uh, the way, for example, uh, no, if we like the way experiment does it, jeez, keep confusing you. If we like it more than, for example, the way um, I don't know if Pygame does it, then you can use experiments user input in a Pygame game, doesn't matter at all. So um, all these packages are independent of each other. For example, this keyboard.break function, it's um, relatively similar, but of course more sophisticated than what I showed you before in Pygame. So um, this has more um, possibilities to customize that. So like I said, every initial experiment is access to the keyboard object. And this keyboard object then has the method wait. And we can wait for a, certain, for a set of keys. We can only wait for a certain time until the timeout. We can wait for until the keyboard, until the key is actually released, or only at the press, or we can wait for the press or for the release. We can call the callback function up on press of this keyboard. So if we, for example, set a duration and the callback function, we can say, for example, if the user requests some, some key, in 100 milliseconds, then we call whatever function we want to call here, and if not, we just continue our control flow. And yeah, this process control events, I don't know what it does right now. So, um, we've seen the debugger already, so I can just show you this in the debugger. Um, so, yeah. So, this is our experiment object, yeah, it's uh, an experiment of type pygame.experiment. And these are all the um, attributes this has. So again, a debugger is so useful, right? Because I, if I printed exp, so what would I have printed? I would have printed... Ah, okay, nothing, bang. So that's 
really, uh, no, I would have printed this experiment, colon, my experiment, no between subject vectors. But this doesn't tell me all the attributes and all the methods my experiment has. If I look at it in the debugger, I can see all the attributes this has. So, um, I can check if, so I can see that my experiment does have a keyboard, experiment.keyboard, and then um, I see, okay, it has some attributes, and this keyboard also has the method, or hold it, that wait. And yeah, so it's all there. Like I said, the experiment has this keyboard object. But that's what I said it has. It has, for example, the data, does it? Yeah, but it's none yet because um, I only initialized it and didn't start the control flow. So if I was one step further here, now data exists if it wouldn't have crashed by now. No, it should respond. Okay, somewhere on my screen there's this window here and I have to press ready because otherwise I don't get here. Yeah, now I have to focus again. Now I have this experiment of data, which is of type data file and all these kinds of stuff. So my experiment has attributes, namely the keyboard and the data and so on. And yeah. The keyboard has this wait function, and um, like I said, it's more sophisticated than what I did before. And we can specify which keys to look for, we want to wait for key release, we can specify a callback function, um, after clicking, clicking the key, we can set a timeout until it's not automatic, and so on. And then the result is a tuple simply of which character we clicked according to this map and the reaction time. So Pygap also uh, must the reaction time in this keyboard operate. So, Let's um, make an experiment that simply asks for uh, pressing any key, and now let's let press the F key. Now this was my, for the button I pressed was 102. Let's look at this translation table. 102 is in fact the B key. Oh no, R, ah, oh, decimal. So yeah, decimal here is the F key. Uh, I rated 5.3 seconds. And then I simply can check, for example, if I press a certain key. So I want to check the backspace, so now let me... Again, it doesn't really work well sometimes in Jupyter. So now um, it waits for the backspace, like I said, so then I can... If I press the backspace, backspace is number 8, that's correct. I press it much faster, and yes, it was indeed the backspace key. So, like I said, same thing as we did before, and I want to show you that before because it's the same principle, uh, but experiment obviously provides the better functions for that than we can write that fast. Yeah, all key and color constants are here, so we have these are the color constants, and further below these are the key constants too. But most of them are just the way you expected it. So the letters are just key underscore n. And then the number, the F keys are key underscore F, whatever, and then backspace and so on. Basically, what you expect, um, you can also look it up here. But I didn't show you mouse input before for um, Pygame, so let me show you that for experiment now. Um, first of all, you may have noticed that we don't have a mouse in here. So, ah, if, I move my, if I move my mouse there, it's gone, and I have to press a key. Um, if I want to show the cursor, I can simply run experiment.mouse.show cursor, and this one shows the cursor. And then I showed you this already. This shows me this nice OK button at the top right, at the bottom right corner. And then, just like there's experiment.key.wait, uh, experiment.keyboard.wait, there's experiment.mouse.wait press. You can also wait for mouse move or whatever. And this then, this, uh, this method, wait press, um, returns me the bottom ID, bottom ID of zero means left button, the position of the mouse and the response time. Um, I don't care for the response time right now, but I care for the position, so we're asking if you press the left button and, and then there's this really nice and convenient method, this button the overlapping with position and then the position of the mouse, uh, if that occurs, then we break. So that means if I press anywhere, Text is zero with pandemic. Ah, 
Okay, so I first of all I do see the cursor, right? I can press anywhere. Um, it uh, will, well, if I would print something here, it will always print something, um, but it doesn't exit unless I click on this very button. So. So now this prints me all the time which we have consecutive clicks, but it doesn't react, it doesn't break unless it's overlapping with the position of the button. Okay. Um, hmm. Actually, I think it's nicer that I end right here and continue with the experiment design on Thursday. It's not as long, like it looks like half year, but it's less than I swear. Um, and I think it's nicer to have that as one consecutive block. And I would then stop here and continue with all this stuff on Thursday. That's fine. Okay, then I will be done.